Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to you all. The nature of God. Well, first of all, in Genesis chapter 1, we are told that it was God that created the heavens and the earth. And also, we're told in the New Testament scriptures in Hebrews, we are told that we must believe that he is, that the almighty God is a rewarder of them that diligently uh, seek him. And therefore, we ourselves have to have a faith in this God. And we are told that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so therefore, we see that we have to have a faith in this God, although we have to say that we have not seen him, yet by the evidence that is revealed to us through his word, the Bible, that we find the evidence that, first of all, that God exists. Because I think, first of all, we have to consider, before we consider his nature, that in fact this God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, exists in this day and generation in which we live. And so, first of all, I want us to go to the prophets of old, out of the Old Testament scriptures. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 43. And we have a couple of passages in Isaiah chapter 43 that will give us the evidence that even in this day and generation, that the Almighty uh, exists. So first of all, let us take these two verses out of, uh, out of Isaiah chapter 43. First of all, verse 1, and then later on, verse 12. And so verse 1 of chapter 43 of Isaiah says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. So here in this word, we, in this verse, we see clearly that the Almighty God, the Creator, has called the children of Israel, or the nation of Israel, uh, by their name, and he tells us clearly in that first verse that they are his. In other words, they are his people. Now when we come down to verse 12 of the same chapter, he says then, I have declared and have saved and I have showed thee when there was no strange God among you therefore ye are my witnesses that is this nation of Israel as saith the Lord that I am God. So what he's saying here really that in this day and generation in which we live that when we see the nation of Israel that when we see a Jew it is a proof to us that there is indeed a God and that he, he exists uh, today. Now there are other parts of scripture that we could look at that would show to us clearly that it is he, the great creator of the heavens and the earth, the almighty God, that is in control of all things. And so then when we come to a knowledge, when we come to understand that the uh, almighty God is the one that created the heavens and the earth, and that he exists, then we ask the question, well, what sort of character or what sort of nature uh, does the Almighty God have? And the first point is that in a physical sense, we are told uh, that he is like a man. For when we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it says there clearly that God created man in his own image. So what of this Almighty God then? Is this almighty God mortal or is he immortal? Well, we find from the word of God that he is immortal because he reveals himself uh, throughout the whole of God's word right from the first chapter in Genesis right through to the last uh, chapter in the book of Revelation. And he presents himself uh, in the past, he presents himself in the present and he also portrays himself in the future. And he tells us that his character is just the same as it was yesterday, today and in the future. So if somebody was to ask us then the question, uh, or to ask us today in this generation to give them a character reference, then what would our response be? Well I think it is that first of all we would have had to know that person for a, a reasonable period of time that in that period of time that we have known that person, that we would have gained for ourselves or had in our minds 
the idea of the character of that person uh, because we would have seen how they would have behaved how they would have reacted in the way they went about uh, doing their business and if it was somebody that we knew well it is almost certain that we would give them what we would call a character reference and we would usually oblige but here we're not just talking about some ordinary person we're talking about the almighty God the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and there there might be a slight difficulty because we are, we are told that nobody has at any time seen the almighty God of the heavens and the earth except that of his son the Lord Jesus Christ so then we ask the question well how in our own minds do we build up for ourselves a character of the almighty God himself how do we find or attain a knowledge of the almighty God <coughs> well the answer is there is only one way in which we can attain this knowledge and information and that through God's word the Bible it's through the Bible that the almighty God reveals himself to man in the past in the present and in the future and as we've already said that it shows that his character is just the same as it was yesterday today and in the future we also have to say that right throughout the history of mankind man has always had the opportunity uh, to uh, get hold of or access to the knowledge of God it has all, uh, always been ready available now God has never left himself at any time without witnesses and so when we look at the ages of man the lack of knowledge of the almighty God and his character or his nature rests not with the attitude of the almighty uh, but with the attitude of man himself and especially in these days in which we live because man himself has set up for himself or the gods of their own making uh, and that is anything that takes the place of God himself it may come in any f uh, shapes and forms it may be some film star uh, some football team or anything to which people will bow down and worship more than anything else in other words it takes up all their time without having any time for the things of God and so therefore they will say that they have no need of God or time of the true God who created the heavens and the earth so we ask ourselves does the almighty in this day and age in which we live does he speak to you and me uh, in these days in which we live well come to the new testament scriptures come to the hebrews and the very first chapter hebrews chapter 1 and the first two verses and it tells us here in this very first verse that God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time passed unto the fathers by the prophets and so if we were to go into the Old Testament scriptures we have there the records of the prophets of old how that the almighty God through, spoke through them uh, to people in times past and it tells us in the next verse verse 2 it is this same God that hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son that's the Lord Jesus Christ whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds so we see here first of all that this almighty God was to speak uh, to the man uh, through his people the nation of Israel it was through this nation of Israel that he was to communicate or to which we would see his character and his nature uh, and and just uh, as a uh, if you like as proof of all this we'll take one of the great kings of the nation of Israel and that is da King David and we find that he comes before the people to offer unto God a prayer of thanksgiving and it's in this prayer that we see this King David acknowledges the majesty and the character if you like of the almighty God so come back with me into the Old Testament and this time into the book of Chronicles in the very first book and at 
in chapter 29 and starting to read at verse 10 and we see here that, that David comes before the Lord to uh, offer unto him a prayer of thanksgiving and he says in verse 10 of First Chronicles 29. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Thou, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And so in those few verses we've just read, here we see that David on his part acknowledges that first of all the Almighty God is the father of the nation of Israel. Or as we have already mentioned, didn't we, in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. That God had called them by their name. And that thou art mine, his people. Or as David says in Chronicles, forever and ever. And so there he acknowledges him as, his, uh, as the creator of all heaven and earth. Is thine, he says. And verse 12, he mentions, doesn't he, in, that, in verse 12 about also his power. Both riches and honour. Uh, come of thee and thou reignest over all and in thine hand is power and might and in thine hand is to make great and to give strength uh, unto all and he goes on in the next verse verse 13 now therefore our God we thank thee and praise thy uh, glorious name now of course the, uh, he's showing here that isn't it that the almighty God that uh, he can do whatsoever he wants that he has the power to perform uh, and great things to give strength to all so God is really revealed here as a king, a father a creator of the heavens and the earth now if we go back a bit further in the Bible we see that he reveals his character when we have the proclamation of his name uh, before Moses in the occasion that he was upon uh, Mount Sinai come back with me a little bit further this time to Exodus chapter uh, 34 and this time we're going to read from verse 5 and here we have a picture don't we of uh, here is Moses upon Mount uh, Sinai and he read in verse 5 and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed his name of the Lord and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God and here we have now some of the characteristics or the nature of the almighty God that the Lord God merciful, gracious long suffering abundant in goodness and in truth now the reason why we looked at these few verses in the Old Testament is that we can now start to get a bit of an opinion uh, as far as we are concerned of the character of the almighty God as we have just read in those few verses in the 34th chapter of, Isaiah, uh, sorry, of Exodus we see here the, the Lord's nature or his characters we may say as it said he is merciful he's gracious he's long suffering uh, which he was in the time of the nation of Israel but we find that the nation of Israel actually turned away from the things of God and of course uh, they are still suffering today because they don't have any time for the things of God but we know that in the future sometime that this will come to an end that this long suffering of the almighty will bring it to an end when he sends his son the Lord Jesus Christ 
back to this earth to establish uh, the, the kingdom. Now also we see time and again throughout the scriptures, throughout the Bible, uh, we see these attributes of the creator the, of God are repeated in both the Old and the New Testament uh, alike. And, and so here are some examples. Here is an example, a proclamation of the to Israel in the days of Hezekiah, where he says, The Lord your God is gracious, merciful, and he will not turn away from you. But of course, as far as the nation was concerned, there was a condition uh, that went with it. Uh, and that uh, they were to return unto him because they had turned away from his commandments and statutes. Now in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah we're told that it was at the time when Israel made a great confession uh, before God of their sins and they said thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And we remind ourselves of this in the, in the New Testament scriptures in 1 John chapter 4 and at verse 8 where it says there that he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love in, his, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live uh, through him and so we see in these uh, verses that we've looked at we start to get an idea of the character of the God who created the heavens and the earth uh, the one who was the God of Israel uh, and it, was, it can be summed up in that word that we just looked at in the 8th verse and that is the word love but what we do see is this word which is a word really in this day and generation that is really used quite loosely uh, by the majority of people in this day and generation but what we see in this word is the truth the righteousness, the grace the mercy, the kindness the compassion, the forbearing the long suffering and goodness of God uh, to man uh, when it reveals to us the character or the nature of himself so having looked at the nature of God that I think most people would like to look at uh, it may be that we might come to the wrong conclusion that it does not matter what we do that in the end everything will come all out alright because God is a God of love and how wrong could we be because when we look at another aspect of the character of the almighty God uh, it's a character that maybe not many people would uh, like to look at most probably almost certainly would turn away from uh, because in the end we have a profound effect upon their future as well as ours and that part of the character or the nature of God is that which is opposite to that which we have briefly looked at and most probably we could say that majority of people do not really understand now the two passages of scripture as I said at the beginning uh, to come to a knowledge and understanding of God's nature of character is through his word, the word of God so I want us now just to go back again into the Old Testament and this time to Numbers chapter 11 and at verse 1 And what do we find here? Here is God's people. What are they doing? It says in verse 1 of Numbers chapter 11. And when the people complained. <coughs> it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And so we see in that verse we've just read 
we noticed they had the people had complained or as the margin puts it uh, always complaining and because of that we notice uh, that the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people the nation of Israel now also if we uh, could look at uh, Lamentations chapter 2 and the first three verses we see that once again the Lord uh, that covers the daughters of Zion with a, a cloud in his anger as we will find in uh, verse 1 Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 1. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud of his anger and cast down from heaven onto the earth the beauty of Israel and redeemed not his footstool in the day of his anger. And so here we see in this verse, don't we, the uh, Lord covering the daughter of Zion with his anger. Verse 2. And the Lord hath swallowed up all the inhabitations of Jacob and, not, and hath not pitied. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughters of Judah. He hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. So we see there in that verse that he hath thrown down his wrath. And then finally in verse, chapter, verse 3 we find there that again he casts off in his fierce anger. And we could also look at Jeremiah. Where it says. Wherefore my fury and my anger. Has put for, poured forth. So in these three parts of scripture then. We see there's two things. About the nature or the uh, character. Of the almighty God. And that is that he shows forth. Wrath. Fury and anger. And we find that if we were to look. In the whole of the Bible. We find in 250 tri times. That we find expressed therein the severity is uh, these expressions of severity are uh, in fact described, uh, and they're described because they're supposed to strike fear into them as God's dealing with men and nations. But one of the all these uh, that we've just looked at may at first shock us at first that God has a character in this way or another. But it is only when we start to look into the real circumstances of things that happened that we suddenly find why it was that God is fully justified in what he has done. In some measure, the reason for God's anger and his fury that was poured out upon people and of nations is because the people or the nation had done one of two things. One, they had contributed to false ideas and thinking or secondly they went against the commandment that God had actually uh, made let us look at some examples or two examples for instance where people have perished, perished in the past uh, because of their false ideas and firstly because maybe they thought that their ways were better than God's ways and another who disobeyed the commandment of God now let's go to the chapter that we read by way of introduction. Numbers chapter 16. We have there the rebellion of Korah, Nath, Dathan and Abiram. Who with, as we're told, with certain of the children of Israel and 250 princes had assembled themselves uh, together against Mer, Moses and Aaron. But most importantly... It was not just against Moses and Aaron, but of course they'd come against uh, the Almighty God. Now God, we know, had separated the tribes, and in particular Levi, uh, the tribe of Levi, to act as a priest. But when we come here to Numbers chapter 16, 
we find here of the false doctrine that Korah was to bring that they were all in fact holy uh, and therefore in Korah's eyes uh, because of that that they were just as capable as that of the Levites to carry out the work of the tabernacle uh, they were just as capable as anybody else but in verse 5 we notice that Moses reminds them doesn't it or reminds Korah who are his and who is holy verse 5 and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company saying even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near uh, unto him and as we have said, it was the uh, sons of Levi who have been given the work of the tabernacle uh, of God. But of course here, Korah saying, he's really saying that that wasn't good enough and that they wanted to do the work of the priesthood as well. And so verse 11 of this uh, 16th chapter, we find them coming against uh, Aaron and Moses for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord that is the Almighty and what is Aaron that ye murmur uh, against him and so we see here in verse 11 they're coming against Moses and Aaron but also against the Almighty himself but when we come down to verse 26 we find something quite remarkable for it says there and he spake unto the congregation Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So what was remarkable here, although God was to bring judgment on Korah and his followers, here is the Almighty showing forth again a part of his other side of his character by giving uh, the opportunity for people to escape that judgment that was to come upon Korah, Dathan and Abiram and then we read in verse 13 the Lord uh, made, made a new thing and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up with all the appertaining unto them and they go down quick into the pit and ye shall understand that these men have provoked uh, the Lord and so it was because of their disobedience uh, against God's commandment that this judgment was to come upon the people and verse 31 and it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that were uh, that the ground clave asunder and was under them and they died so in this uh, incident then that we have here in the 16th chapter we see really two sides of the character of God we see on one side his goodness and his mercy and giving the people the opportunity to escape that judgment which was to come but we also see on the other side his, his severity if you like of God in that uh, those who would not obey his commandments and statutes now I just want to look at one more instance uh, that might seem on the face of it when we look at it a rather a bit on the harsh side and that was to deal with Uzzah who disobeyed God's commandment in verse Chronicles uh, chapter 3 13. God had given the commandment that anybody who touched the ark would die uh, because it was holy. And in first uh, in first uh, Chronicles chapter 13, we we have the record there of the ark travelling from uh, Kajeth Jerem when it comes to the threshing floor of Chindon. And we we have the record there that the ark stumbles. Uh, but also puts forth his hand uh, to hold the ark and because of that because he disobeyed God then we are told that he perished and died uh, and again we see in that incident don't we that we have the, the severity of God now in the days of Jeremiah we have the time when Jerusalem had given off over to complete idolatry that just prior to the judgments coming upon Jerusalem we see that Jeremiah was given the commission to walk to and fro through the city of Jerusalem and if he could find a man, only one man uh, that executed or seeketh for the truth, it says, or the ways of God, 
that once again we see the mercy of God in that he was going to uh, pardon it. So we see then in times past that God uh, has brought upon men uh, his judgments. But also in the past, however, that judgment has even effect upon us in this day in which we live. We think briefly of the fall of man that we have recorded in Genesis chapter 3, where we have there the record of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And because of their disobedience uh, to God's commandments, they were told that they were to return to the uh, ground from whence they were taken. And so therefore, as we are descendants of Adam and Eve, likewise, we are the same. That is our nature. We are, we are mortal. We return to the ground from whence we came. We're not like of the Almighty God who is immortal, who is everlasting to everlasting as far as the east is from the west if you like uh, and if the, the almighty had left it at that point where man had disobeyed God uh, then there would have been no hope for you and me but in Romans we're told aren't we the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life if we are to pray, prepare to uh, follow his commandments and statutes and again we think of the goodness of the almighty because we are told that he is not willing that any should perish but quite the opposite that we should have the hope of everlasting life and so the almighty has given us even in this day and generation the opportunity to those who believe uh, in him and also in connection with the sacrifice of his son the lord jesus christ because it was by that sacrifice of the lord jesus christ that the Almighty was to give us the opportunity in which we could escape the reward to which we are entitled to and to have a, a hope of everlasting life. But it would be something that we had, would not earn, uh, but we would be given by the love and the grace of the Almighty. And so, my dear friends, in a very, very short time, we have seen the nature and the character of God as it is revealed to us within the Scriptures, we see that he is from everlasting to everlasting, that he is immortal, that he is a living and a loving and merciful God, that whatever he, judgments he might bring upon mankind, he gives the man the opportunity to escape. We've seen on the other hand the severity of God, of those who disobey his commandments. And so in this day and generation, he's still giving man and woman the opportunity to escape that which he is entitled to and in the end it really comes down to choice doesn't it we all have a free will we can accept it or we can turn away from it we can either leave our lives now and at the end we will have lived it and we will perish or on the other hand we can accept what God has revealed to us through his word as we see that character or his nature are revealed unto us. And if we are prepared to accept it, if we are prepared to follow his commandments and his statutes, and then at the time when he will send his son back to the earth to establish the kingdom, that he might, by his grace, give us a place in that kingdom. But the choice is ours. We can either accept it or we can decline it. But we have to say also that that time of opportunity is now getting less and less. Because the Lord has in his own mind the time when he will send his son to establish God's kingdom upon this earth.